I love the Word of God, don't you? The longer I study it, the more I learn of it, the more I respect it. This is quite a remarkable book, folks. I'll be honest with you tonight. A great deal of what you've heard preached down through the years from this place and that place, this place and that place, is very, very shallow stuff, repetitious, and they don't really do justice to the book. One of the reasons that people do that is because there are things in this Bible that aren't easy to understand. The Apostle Peter said that. He said things hard to be understood. Then he makes reference to the Apostle Paul and to his writings. So uh, I'm very leery of someone who claims to be a scholar of the Word of God. I'm a student of the Bible, and I pray that God will continue to teach me as long as I'm teachable. That's what I want to do is learn His Word as long as I'm here. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Psalm, chapter 88. Now, we know in chronology, we go back to the times of some of our heroes in the Bible. We know that David wrote many of the Psalms. As a matter of fact, if you'll remember, this past Sunday, Brother McNeese was reading from the Psalms of Degrees. And if I told you then, if you didn't know what that meant, these are degrees that have to do with the ascension to the top of the mountain. And they would stop and meditate and do that. Father, bless your word tonight. In your holy name, amen. Lord God of my salvation, I have cried day and night before thee. Let my prayer come before thee. Incline thine ear unto my cry. For my soul is full of troubles, and my life draweth near unto the grave. I'm counted with them that go down into the pit. I'm as a man that hath no strength, free among the dead like the slain that lie in the grave, whom thou rememberest no more, and they are cut off from thy hand. Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the deeps. Father, bless this now in your holy name. Amen. All right. Now this psalm was written about 1,000 years before Christ which would make it 3,000 years old. As you read the Bible, you realize that the people that uh, Scripture records in their lives, they're no different from us. And as you go back to the time of Abraham, he's almost 2,000 years before Christ. He's 1,900 B.C. The man who wrote the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, lived about 1,400 B.C. He preceded David by about 400 years. And these, these times, you know, they're, they're not fixed in stone. You may find a writer who says that Moses was 1500 B.C. or 1300 B.C. Don't get caught up in that. The main thing is that you know that Moses was here and you know the book was written and it's inspired scripture. And that's what's important to me. Uh, the 88th Psalm says, uh, where is God? He totally felt abandoned. Look at verse number 13 of Psalm 88. Psalm 88 and verse number 13. If I can get to it here. All right, here's what it says. But unto thee have I cried, O Lord, and in the morning shall my prayer prevent thee. Verse 14, Lord, why castest thou off my soul? Why Hidest thou thy face from me. Have you ever felt that way? I have. So I can identify with this person. I can identify, this is a real person. You wonder where God is. I as told you before that I listened to Johnny uh, Erickson uh, Tada. I listened to her uh, as much as I possibly can. And I listened to her just a few minutes ago. And she was talking about how that when she was first injured and uh, diagnosed as a, paraple uh, as a quadriplegic, uh, that uh, she didn't want to accept that. Uh, she didn't want to accept the fact that she'd spend the rest of her life in a wheelchair. She didn't want that. So she set about to be healed in however she possibly could. So she said she went to healing meetings, healing preachers, got in prayer lines, did everything that she could possibly do. And, but uh, she wasn't healed. Uh, there are those today who teach that if you're not healed, it's your fault because you lack the faith to be healed. Now, I firmly believe God heals. 
Take Dr. Renfro up in Virginia, for example. He was healed of incurable cancer, and the doctor sent him home to die. But there's no question that that is a miracle, that God healed him. And we had him here at the church, I think 2017, 18, somewhere back in there. And the reason that I had this dear brother come down is because I wanted people to hear his testimony, number one. And I wanted for them to have uh, hope if they had, had been called a terminal disease or something of that nature, that they could put their trust and faith in God and let God make that final decision as to whether they would live or not. Now, that's what I believe about healing. I believe in praying for the sick. I believe in anointing them. I believe in praying for God to heal them and raise them up and then put them in the hands of the Lord. And ultimately, God's going to make the final decision as to whether they live or they don't live. But I'm always pray for them and pray for God to raise them up. And so this is what I believe. I believe that God is for us. He's not against us. The Bible said when Christ came 2,000 years ago, he was a friend of sinners. Did you know that sometimes the greatest need that a sinner has is a friend? Uh, if you came out of the world, you know how the world is. You'll understand that uh, it's dog eat dog for the most part. And you're the greatest guy around as long as you've got a pocket full of money and you can buy the liquor and so forth. But you're, once, you, once, you, once you're broke, then they'll find someone else. They're done with you. And uh, that's sad, isn't it? Well, the truth of the matter is there's an awful lot of church people like that too. But uh, that's right. So he's a friend of sinners. He was your friend before you ever knew him. That's right. He made himself a friend to you. And that's a good thing. And because the Bible teaches the, friend, the biblical friend sticketh closer than a brother. So for someone to say that God never had anything to do with them before they got saved, uh, you're speaking in ignorance. You don't know that. God may have spared your life. He may have healed you. He may have heard you. And a lot of things he could have done for you. And all of that is preparing you for the day that you would meet him. So we start out in the 88th Psalm, and he feels abandoned. He said, why did you hide your face from me? Well, you remember the Lord Jesus cried upon the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou what? Forsaken me. So a lot of these things are types pointing forward to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the book of Numbers, in chapter number 20 and verse 4, this is quite a powerful statement. Numbers chapter 20 and verse 4, listen to what he says here. Numbers 20 and verse number 4. And why have you brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness, that we and our cattle should die there? Are you playing with us? This was, the, this, this was it. You see, Israel had spent 400 years in, in Egyptian bondage, in pagan idolatry, and they didn't know the Lord. They had, uh, they had uh, traditions, but as far as personally knowing the scriptures, knowing, following the Lord God, they knew very little of him. And they had to learn. So we were talking about a group of people that were slaves. And if you remember one of the first things they did when they came out of the land, when Moses was on top of that mountain, talking to God, they, had, they created apis. They, they, put their, they put their gold in there, and apis, which was the bull of Egypt, and Aaron stood back and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, that brought thee out of the land of Egypt. And so, my friend, you see the idolatry as it springs forth. They took a while, and some of them never did really get a hold of the fact that the God that they served could not be, you could not make any image of him. There is nothing that exists that you could ever create that would give you an idea of what God looked like. Why? Because no man's ever seen him. He said, Don't you ever make a graven image of me. Because you don't know what I look like. Uh, I was reading Charles Spurgeon yesterday, doing a little research into this, and I was quite amazed at what he said. This was about 16, I mean, 1855, 1856, before the Civil War in this country. And, of course, you know that Spurgeon was an Englishman. And he was very well known during his lifetime, and obviously since then. Most people have heard of Spurgeon. But here's what he said about the nature of God. He says, God, in his essence, is unknowable. He said, there's no way you can know the essence of God or the full nature of who he is because there's nothing to compare it to because we do not know the essence of a spirit being. And this man said that over 100 years ago. It's, awful, it's always good to read something uh, coming from the lips of someone like that. They had lived so many 
uh, years before you that said the same thing that I say. It shows that God revealed it to him just as he did me. Now Spurgeon says, leave it alone. You cannot define, you cannot describe that invisible being. He's above and beyond our words. And so I, I agree with Brother Spurgeon. But what you have here in Numbers chapter 20, verse number four, is an accusation that God had deceived them. You see, he had deceived them. First he abandoned in Psalm 88. Now he has deceived them, they say. Now I want you to look at the book of Exodus chapter number five and verse number 22. Those of you in this house tonight, when God saved your soul, did you know what to expect? Did you know what the future held? I wasn't looking into the future. I was looking to the one that saved me. I was so carried away with the fact that he could change my life in a moment. And that's what he did. He changed me completely, instantaneously, from the creature that I was into a believer in Christ and changed my nature. In verse number 22 of the book of Exodus, chapter number 5, look what happens between Moses and the Lord. And Moses said, and Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Lord, Wherefore hast thou so evil entreated this people? Why is it that thou hast sent me? What was the purpose of all of this? Look how you've treated them. Look what these people have gone through. What are you doing? Playing games with us? This is in the mind of Moses bordering on treachery. What is treachery? Treachery is when you falsely present yourself and make promises and accusations that you're not going to uphold and then you turn against the one who's supposed to be your friend and the one who put their trust in you, that's treacherous. God doesn't do that, folks. He's accused of abandoning, he's accused of deceiving, and he's accused of treachery. But in none of these cases, of course, we know God. You see, turn to the book of Jeremiah, chapter number nine. Jeremiah, chapter nine. And verse number 23. Thus saith the Lord, capital Jehovah, capital L-O-R-D, covenant-keeping God. That's what that word means when you find it. King James Bible put it in printer's type. So the word, if you looked into the Hebrew text, what you'd find here is what's called the tetragrammaton, yod Hey vau Hey, And they took the Masoretic vowel points, put it to it, and we're, we get the word Jehovah from it. In verse number 23, thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. We got plenty of that. Neither let the mighty man glory in his might. There's a lot of that. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. Do you know him tonight? I'm not asking you if you know him in salvation. Probably most of the folks in this house tonight, maybe all of you, are born again believers, I hope so. But this is not what he's talking about. What's he talking He's talking about knowing him, knowing his character, knowing the God that you serve. I want to tell you something. If you think that you're gonna be able to serve the Lord because of what he does for you, you'll never make it. If you think that you're gonna be able to serve the Lord because of the people he brings into your life, you'll never make it. If you think you're going to be able to serve the Lord and live out your testimony because of just sheer force of will, you'll never make it. The only way that you'll ever or I will ever be able to live a victorious life the way God wants us to live it is to trust in the character of the one that we believe in tonight. Yeah, his character. So therefore it would behoove us to study his character. He said, I'm the Lord. He said, I'm not like you. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways than your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. And that's God. And we get arrogant, don't we? We get real religious. Sometimes our halo bangs on the back of our head, you know. We get in trouble. It happens to us. It really does. We're all, we're all uh, culpable. But the truth of the matter is, if we take a good, long, hard look at ourselves, we'll find out at how dependent we really are on the Lord. And your drifting starts the moment you take your eyes off the Lord Jesus and start depending on your, 
oh, let's say your skill, your talents, your abilities, uh, your connections, the people you know, you know, the money you got in the bank, your health. I mean, you're in perfect health. You're young. And so the truth is you may never acknowledge it in your life, but that's really what you're trusting. You're not trusting the Lord. And this is why we sing songs like we did a few minutes ago. So how do you know him? Well, he said in, so in Jeremiah 9 that he understandeth and knoweth me. I've learned a little about him. I really have. I've learned a little about him. And I know there's a lot more that I can learn about him. Did you know, my dear friend, that you'll learn more in one day grinding in a mill, one day lying in a, death, a sick bed, one day of sorrow and pain and suffering, you'll learn more in one day of that than you will in 10 years on a mountaintop. Yes, you will. Yes, sir. You'll learn more about God because you'll meet God in the valley like you can never meet him on the mountain because it's in the valley that he forges your character. He told him, he said, I brought you out of an iron furnace, talking to Israel. There's where your character is forged. So why is character important? Because character is everything with God. If you don't know his character, you have no relationship with him. If, all, the only, if the only relationship you have with the Lord is all the scriptures you can quote, chapters of the Bible you can quote, catechisms that you know, churches you belong to, you don't know anything. You just know a bunch of intellectual stuff. God's a person. He's a person. He really is. He's immutable. Now, most of you know what that word means. That's just a big word that simply means unchanging. He said, I change not. He cannot change. He's immutable. So therefore, the same God that saved me in 1973 is the same God that empowers me, gives me strength tonight. I know a little more about him tonight than I did then. And God has uh, probably could have taught me much more if I hadn't been so rebellious hard-headed, stubborn, and arrogant, full of myself. So you get like that preacher? Oh, you do too. <laughs> we all do. We all have a bout with ourselves. Sometimes we'll spend the whole day fighting self and spend a little bit of time with the Lord. Amen. I know that. I know there's a lot of folks around whose, whose halo gets tarnished a little bit if you talk to them like that. They can't handle that kind of talk, but the truth of the matter is they're just as sorry and low down as any of the rest of us. The Apostle Paul said in the book of Titus, of all the sinners on this earth, I was chief. See the heads shaking. I'm glad you caught me. What did he say? I am, present tense, chief. So, yes. So how do we know him? We understand him. The Bible says in the book of Exodus, chapter number 33 and verse number 13, Moses learned something about the Lord. Exodus 13, verse 13. He says, Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. You know what's happening here? Moses is becoming an intercessor. Now I get on... I, I read these. I read a lot of a, a lot of the comments under the YouTube messages, and folks, I start praying. You, you you can't help when you read some of these comments. Bless your soul. Some of these people are going through horrible times, horrible horrible times, and they're reaching out for somebody who cares. And I'll read one and I'll stop and I'll pray, and I'll read another one and I'll stop and I'll pray. And if you don't have anything to pray about, just get on the just get on YouTube, and just look up the messages that we've uh, the Sunday school lessons or the Sunday morning, Sunday night, and just read what the people say as they comment. Now there's about, as far as I know, six or seven or eight different channels that 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 play the messages, and they all have comments, and you've got plenty of comments. And you talk about a ministry that can be a ministry for someone. All you need is a computer. You don't even have to leave your house a computer, log on, and start reading. Well, there's one lady who's an Australian. About a year ago, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And obviously, there are different types of breast cancer. I didn't know that, but I'm not a doctor. How could I? But she was diagnosed with a, with a type, and she named it 
that is very aggressive, very aggressive. So she, uh, she has a YouTube channel, and I, watched, uh, I, I had been watching some of the things on her YouTube channel because of some of the things she was making and some of the things she was doing, and I was learning. And then she came out with one and said she'd been diagnosed with breast cancer. And, uh, and, uh, and when I found that out, I started praying for her. I started praying. She's an Australian. She's on the, the other side of the globe. Started praying for her. And God really put her on my heart. And today, I went to her site, and I began to read the comments underneath. Over 1,500 comments. 1,500 comments. She's got a, a huge following. And so many of them were Christian comments. Where they're praying for her. They're praying for her. They're praying for her. They're praying for her. You see how something like that can be used for good? You see that? Are you on there watching pornography or are you on there praying with people? Which one are you doing? Are you hooked on pornography? Let me tell you something. This might be a good way to get out of your pornography. Start praying for that naked woman you're looking at. <laughs> Start praying for that scene that you're watching. Start praying for them. Oh, well, preacher, I could, yeah, I could do that. I'd be kind of awkward, wouldn't it? Kind of flips it upside down, right? Are you a preacher up in the pulpit? You're trying to preach to people and you're hooked on pornography? Get on there and start praying for them. Don't get on there and start watching it. Just pray. You might be surprised what, how something like that gets you out of that filth and gets you into somewhere God can talk to you and use you. Amen. Say, why do you say that? Well, the latest, the, latest, the latest poll I read was something like 30, 40, 50 percent of the, of the men in the churches in America are hooked on pornography. Do you know how fast pornography will destroy your marriage? It'll destroy it. Yeah. Boy, things have, Lord of mercy, folks, it's so quiet. I'm scary at how quiet it's gotten in here tonight. Mm -hmm. That bothers me. <laughs> if you are into that stuff, get out of it. Get on your knees. Ask God to give you grace and start praying for those people that are on the... Hey, by the way, I meant to tell you this. You'd be amazed at how many ex-porn stars are saved now. You mean God would save a porn star? Of course he would. Save anybody. Pray for them. Lord, help us tonight. <laughs> We're ready for a revival meeting, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, Moses said uh, he wanted to intercede. Intercession's a great ministry, folks. I don't, how can I say it to you tonight? How can I emphasize it enough? There's so many people that go to the church house, they got a phony Christian religion. It's phony. It's all verbal. It's all emotional. It's all shallow. It doesn't go a quarter of an inch deep in their life. It doesn't change the way they live. It's phony. Now, I didn't tell you the Christian faith is phony. I told you they had a phony Christian religion. How many of you agree with that tonight? Amen. Amen. Now, you have to have his character. Look at Psalm chapter number 73 and verse 25. Psalm 73 and verse number 25. The writer said, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon the earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Boy, that's strong, isn't it? Boy, how many of you have loved ones that have gone on to heaven? Buddy, I do. I do. You better believe it. I have loved ones that have gone on to heaven. You better believe it. And I'm looking forward to the day when I see them again. Amen. I will. But I want you to look at the Song of Solomon. The Song of Solomon. Uh, chapter. Let me see if I can find it. 2 verse 16. Song of Solomon chapter number 2 verse 16. Remember now, the Song of Solomon is about fellowship between the bride and Christ. Here's what she says in verse 16, chapter number 2. 
My beloved is mine. And I am his. He calls her my love. She calls him my beloved. She says, my beloved is mine. And I am his. He is mine. I am his. We've got a song that says that, don't we? Isn't that wonderful? That's what's called reciprocation. They reciprocate. He says, I love you. She says, I love you. You can't tell God that you love him and he not know it. He knows if you love him. He, that's right. Now, that may be why it's awkward to tell him you love him because you really don't love him. But if you really love him, you're going to tell him you love him. Yes. You tell him you love him. I love you, Lord. I love you. That's the greatest thing you could do. Did you know that? The greatest of all the commandments puts all the rest of them to sleep. It says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul. Do you remember Sunday this past, when was it? I forget when, last Wednesday night, I forget. But I was talking about these scriptures in the Bible where he told one young man, sell what you've got, give it to the poor. He said, uh, he said I've kept all the commandments, so here's one, keep this one, do this. He named off three different things. And somebody said, well, he told people how to get saved three different ways. No, had nothing to do. Doing that did not save them. Doing that read their heart. That's what it took to get down inside their soul. See, that was the impediment. That's the impediment. That's the wall. That's what's, that's what's stopping that trust and faith in God. The Old Testament saints saved exactly like you are. He trusts God, believes the Lord, trust him. I mean, how else? He couldn't be saved by keeping the law. By the deeds of the law, no flesh should be justified. No, he couldn't do it. But here at Psalm 73 and verse 25. Psalm 73 and verse number 25. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. Did you ever read that scripture in Psalm 42 where he says, My I, soul panteth after God like the heart panteth after the water brook? Desires God? That's a step. That's a progressive step. You don't start out by desiring God. You start out by wanting to communicate with him, to have fellowship with him. But as that fellowship and communication grows and reaches the place where it should reach, God's all you live for. God's all that matters. That's all that matters. Everything else has to take its place. Now the Lord reminded Israel that he brought them out of an iron furnace, Deuteronomy chapter number 4 and verse number 20. That's where he brought me from, an iron furnace. He reached down into hell and he touched me. That's where he found me. He didn't find me in church. He didn't find me in club somewhere. Oh, I went, I staggered into Third Creek every once in a while, grumbling and griping every time I went. If I could get out of it and go play a pinball machine, that's exactly what I'd do. I had no use for church until he reached down and touched me. I heard a preacher preach one time about where God touches you. He said, that's just a bunch of junk. Let me tell you why you say that, sir, because you've never been touched. <laughs> you let him touch you and you won't. You'll change your tune. He touched me. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter number 16, he talks about passing by in the wilderness, and there this newborn lies in its blood. No one pities it. And it's, it's, it's terrible, the condition that it's in. And the Lord said, I passed by thee and saw thee talking to Israel. And this Israel becomes a type of who we are. He didn't come by and clean me up and then save me. That's religion. That's where you make yourself presentable to God. That's garbage. You don't know how to make yourself presentable to God. He doesn't want you to clean up. He wants you to come just as you are. He wants you to come dragging all of the filth and sins and degradation and damnation that bears on your soul. He wants you to come just as you are. He delights in washing that all away with the blood of Christ. Amen. But religion wants you to get better. Religion teaches you how to approach God. Religion teaches you how to pray. If somebody has to teach you how to pray, there's a problem. Yesterday I was reading the Bible and I thought, why didn't I see this before? 
How many read the book of Job where the devil appeared before the Lord? How many remember that? Okay. And how many remember reading, and somebody was preaching on it the other day, I forget who it was, it's talking about these spirits presented themselves before the Lord and, and, and the Lord said, who will go and will lie or deceive, all right, Ahab? And this one spirit says, I'll go and be a lying spirit in the mouth of his prophets. The Lord said, go. Now, let me ask you a question. Were these spirits talking to God? Of course they were. Did Satan talk to God in Job chapter number one? Of course he did. So somebody tells you, well, oh, prayer is just simply talking to God. Is it really? They were talking to God. That was not prayer. No, that was not prayer. What happens in prayer? You enter into a spiritual relationship with Almighty God that only you can. And then when you start talking, he starts talking. Or he starts talking and you start talking. But you talk on a level that is much higher than simply talking. You are speaking in a spiritual world to a spirit being who is communicating with you on a level that is even higher than the human mind. He's speaking to you on a level that is up there with God himself. And here's the thing. Don't be discouraged when I say what I'm about to say to you. Sometimes you can pray and you'll think, well, I didn't hear anything from God. I mean, what's happened here? Don't ever trust your mind and your heart is your relationship with God. Take God at his word. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, right? He said, if you come unto me, I will in no wise cast you out. That's what he said. Let me explain myself and make myself clear tonight. Once you rise up to that level, you may not comprehend everything that's going on between you and God, but he does. And he will answer you. And he may not answer you at that moment, but he will answer you. He'll answer you in a way and a time and a place of his choosing. And it'll come to you. And when it does come to you, you may have to say, my goodness, I wasn't expecting that. And you might not have been, but God knows what he's doing. Psalm Deuteronomy chapter number 8 and verse number 2. It says this. Deuteronomy 8, 2. How many of you know the word Deuteronomy means the second giving? Deuteronomus. It's the conjunction of two words. Deutero, second, namos, law. Deuteronomus or Deuteronomy. It means the second giving of the law. And so we read over here in chapter number uh, 8 and verse number 2. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee and to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. Let me ask you a question tonight. Do you think the Lord already knew what was in their heart? All of this was for their knowledge not his. How are you doing with it then? Are you going through a real hard trying time? What's it done to you? Has it driven you away from God or has it driven you closer to God? Are you listening to Satan? Or are you listening to the Lord? Because we all go through these times. We go through them. And while you're going through that time, he wants you to learn something about your character. Do you really believe the Lord? Do you trust him? Do you believe in his faithfulness? Do you believe in his long suffering? Do you believe in his character? Do you really believe the God of the whole earth will do right? Do you really believe that? Do you believe that you have to be able to justify everything that you do? That's self-righteousness. Do you remember what's, what uh, uh, Joseph said? He said, you meant it for evil. But God meant it for good. Do you suppose Joseph knew that when he was locked up in the dungeon? Or did his walk with God show him what God allowed him to go to Egypt for? If Joseph had not been in Egypt, his father and his people would have died. They would have starved to death. But God used Joseph to fill up the barns for the seven plenteous years. Gave him the vision. You all have read the story. It was because of the strategic placing of Joseph in Egypt that this happened. 
He didn't probably had no idea when they sold him to the Ishmaelites, dug a pit, and had not been for Judah, they'd have killed him. But because Judah intervened, they sold him into slavery, and so he went down into Egypt. I don't know what went through Joseph's mind. I don't know what went through his mind when he was in the, in the, in the dungeon. But he, the, the, ba the baker and the butler had forgotten about him. You remember that? It was like John the Baptist when he was locked up in the prison. He'd been in there and he was smelling that stench and looking at the vermin. He said to his disciples, go ask him. Are you the one that should come or should we look for another? Well, there was a day when the Holy Spirit came down upon John the baptizer. And he said, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. No greater statement had ever been said of Christ before that moment. No, no greater. And it was loaded theologically <laughs> that taketh away the sin of the world. But where did he say that? He said that because of the voice of God in his soul. God made it clear to him, plain to him. And the Holy Spirit came down as a dove when he baptized him. Heavens opened and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. John right there. Yet having seen all of that, he got so low that he said, go ask him. Is he the one that should come or should we look for another? We can get there. It happens to all of us. We can get so low. We can let Satan beat us down. Here's how Satan operates too, by the way. How many of you are fully aware of what Hamas did to those Israelites over there? October the 6th or 7th, I forget the day. 6th, wasn't it? 7th, October the 7th. How many of you remember what they did? It's a heinous thing, okay? All right, let me tell you what's been going on between Israel and Hamas now for decades. It's what's called a war of attrition. Say, so what is a war of attrition? A war of attrition is not where you have a hundred thousand army meets another hundred thousand army and they clash on the battlefield and they fight and the, winner, and the winner comes out. That's not a war of attrition. A war of attrition is when they hit this group, they hit this company, they, they, they come down upon this battalion from a mountainside or they, they, they burn down their supplies and, and they're constantly sniping and sniping and sniping and coming after them. A war of attrition is a prolonged thing. That's exactly what's been going on between Israel and Hamas and, and, and Hezbollah and some other things. Well, this is how Satan operates. He's good at attrition. He's good at sniping, backing off, sniping again backing off, sniping again, backing off. That's his mode. That's his uh, uh, MO, modus operandi. Smite you, smite you, then back off. That's the way Satan operates. You might have gotten through today and you hadn't heard anything from him, hadn't felt anything from him, but he may hit you in the morning like you haven't been hit in a long time. That's attrition. That's attrition. That's the war of attrition. And my dear friend, that's one of the hardest to fight. Because your enemy hits you and then he flees. He flees off. He's gone. And it would be much uh, easier to stand on the battlefield and face your enemy. But he doesn't fight like that. He snides a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking, seeking, seeking. Are you vulnerable tonight? I get vulnerable. I get Sometimes it, it really affects me when I, when I realize how vulnerable I get. Have you ever had a good long talk with the devil? Have you ever gotten to the point when you listen to the devil so much you start agreeing with him? How many do that? I do. He makes sense. Satan, Satan can make a, oh, a lot of rational human wisdom. Satan's good at it. He's very good at it. Oh, I listen to the devil. We have some good conversations. <laughs> and then after a while I realize that's not the Holy Ghost. That's the devil. Because he's looking at it from human wisdom and a human perspective. You got to get out. You got to understand. You got to you got to identify the weapons that are arrayed against you. That's the battle. That's the battle it rages. So you mean to tell me, in a preacher, that uh, that 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 you don't have some kind of a, a spiritual power that you've defeated Satan, and that and that all you got to do is tell him to jump, and he jumps, and just tell him to run, and he runs, and 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 the problem is over between you and the devil. That's exactly right. I don't. I never know when he's going to come after me. I may wake up at two o'clock tomorrow morning, and there he stands. Here he goes comes again. So what do you do? It's a war of attrition. A war of attrition. A war of attrition. And that's the kind of battle that he likes to fight. Yeah. But I like this one. 
Isaiah 63, 9. I'll close with this tonight. This, this is one of my favorite scriptures. I really do. I love this one. Isaiah 63. And verse number 9. In all their affliction he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity he redeemed them. And he bare them and carried them all the days of old. Why does God want to feel what I feel? He said, he was afflicted. Why that? Are you one of the, are you one of the people who, who use the word why a lot? Y'all do a Google search with the word why. Y'all do a Google search on questioning God. How many times was God questioned? People had questions for him. Why? Why does God want to feel what I feel? Does it ever say in the Bible that God feels what angels feel? Does it ever say in the Bible that he feels what a cherubim or a seraphim feels? Not one time. But what a man feels? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Why does he want to do that? Well, this is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he came and he feels what we feel. He still feels it. So therefore, when he comes to the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, equipped with all that Christ earned, paid for, and belongs to him, now he through the Holy Spirit can minister to you what he feels, what he felt. He knows what it feels like. You've been abandoned of God, he was abandoned. Treachery? Oh yeah, Judas, <laughs> do you kiss the son of man? Judas Iscariot, one of his own, treachery. Yeah, oh yeah, sold for 30 pieces of silver. Failure? Well, my goodness, folks, when they nailed him on the cross, the only disciple left was John. What happened to all these men that sat by the fire? And what about these guys that watched him walk on water? What about them that was, they were there when he raised Lazarus from the dead? I mean, good night, he turned, uh, turned that uh, fishes and bread, fed 5,000 two or three times in the Bible. But it did not support them. It did not get them through. Do you know why? Because they had not been anointed by the power of the risen Christ through the Holy Ghost of God that had come down and in John chapter number 20, he breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. He anointed them with the power of his resurrection. <laughs> he anointed them with the power that he has over Satan. He anointed them with the power that only the resurrected Christ can have. Through his word, people can be saved. He anointed them with that. And he breathed on them as he bred and uh, breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life and a piece of clay became a living human being here he breathes on his disciples and man alive did they ever receive yes they did yes they did and on the day of Pentecost the church of God was born by the power of the Holy Spirit of God coming down and these disciples who ran from the Jews before now stood eyeball to eyeball right in their face and said we ain't running anywhere because they've been given the power of the Holy Spirit. And he is ours tonight, and we are his. Ask God to fill you. Be not drunk with wine, we're in his excess. But be what? Filled. Well, I've been filled. Don't get filled again. You mean you can be filled with the Holy Ghost more than once? Oh, yeah. Let me tell you something, now shut up. It depends on how much you leak. <laughs> <laughs> how tight is your vessel <laughs> oh you better believe you can be filled more than one time amen I'll tell you the truth tonight I have no idea how many times God has come to me and I've prayed for the filling of the Holy Spirit and felt his power come down on my soul and I knew he'd answered my prayer but then you drift around and you know and first thing you know you need that power again amen Father, bless your word. Thank you for the little time we've had together. We bless the name of our Lord Jesus Christ.
who is worthy above all, way above anything we could ever ask or think, say of him, we could never praise his righteous name enough, our Lord Jesus Christ, worthy of all. In his holy, righteous name I pray. Keep your heads bowed tonight, nobody looking. Just ask yourself, Lord, I, I agree with what that pastor says. I need that filling of the Holy Spirit of God. And just ask him. Now, he may choose a way to do that, but just ask him. And he will fill you because he wants you to be full because it is a Christian that is filled with the Holy Spirit that is a threat to Satan, a real threat, because he knows where the power lies. Father, bless your name and your word. Let it go forth now for the purpose you intended. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank